So we are in Acts chapter 12 this morning as we teach through the Bible, verse by verse. Um, When you look at history of the early church in the book of Acts, as we have been for the last few months, and when you look at non-biblical historical documents, it is amazing the number of people who lay down their lives for the gospel. Someone once said that The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And once again, we see uh, a spirit of being a faithful witness in Acts chapter 12 with James and with the Apostle Peter. So uh, I I just want to dive into it this morning and get into it uh, and work through it. So we're in Acts chapter 12, and we'll read the first couple of verses here. Um, And it says this. Now, about the time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church, then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now, as I said, when you look at church history, um, what's seen in the scripture and in uh, various documents, you see quite the track record, quite the statement from the apostles and church leaders. Uh, It happened to some of the very best people in the church. James was beheaded in Jerusalem. Matthew was, well, put to the sword in Ethiopia, they say. Matthew, uh, yeah, Mark was dragged through the streets of Alexandria. Luke was hung on an olive tree in Greece. John was put in a boiling cauldron of oil. Thankfully, it wasn't too hot. He escaped, but later he was banished to the island of Patmos, which was like a concentration camp of their day. It was their Alcatraz. Peter, they say, was crucified in Rome upside down. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Andrew was crucified and preached to his persecutors until he died. Thomas was run through his body with a lance in the East Indies, they say. Barnabas was stoned to death in Salonica. Paul the Apostle was beheaded in Rome by Nero. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, at the very beginning, he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And that word witness in the original language in the Greek is martyrio, and we get our English word what? Martyr. Now, in that first century, uh, that word martyrio, it it meant witness, to to bear testimony. Uh, It didn't really mean the idea of dying for your faith. But because the Christians were so faithful in being a witness, being martyrial, witnessing, bearing testimony and not backing down, and being faithful even to death, the word eventually picked up that other meaning of dying for your faith, of being a martyr. You know, in order for the word of God to spread, like we see in the book of Acts, people had to, they had to take a chance. They had to take a risk. And those early Christians, they were risk takers. As I say, you know, there's three types of pastors. There's, uh, what is it? Caretakers. Mer- what is it? Caretakers, undertakers, and risk takers. I don't want to be a caretaker. I don't want to be an undertaker. I want to be a risk taker. Stepping out in faith for the Lord. Well, these guys, they stuck out their neck a lot of times, and you see it constantly in the book of Acts, and God came through for them, but sometimes they died for the faith, which was not God not coming through for them. It was just that was what God had in his plan for them. James was beheaded in 43 AD. How do we know that? Well, because Herod dies in this chapter, and so we, we have some dates that are connected with this whole event. Well, let's dive in here. Let's look at chapter, as we go along here, chapter 12, verse Three, it says, and because he saw, we're talking about Nero, and be, or not Nero, uh, Herod, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, harassing the church, persecuting the church, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. So here's Herod, and he sees that persecuting the church, harassing the church, arresting the apostles, it pleases the Jewish religious establishment. And so, you know, and he's trying to please Rome on top of that. He desired the praise of men. He was a popularity seeker, so he arrested Paul to please the crowd, to play to the crowd. Well, verse 4, so when he had arrested him, 
talking about Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after the Passover. <clears throat> a squad, they say, was four soldiers. So four squads would be what? Four squads of four. That's a lot of soldiers, man. Why, why the guard detail of four guard, you know, four squads of four? Why? Well, Peter had a bit of a track record, didn't he? If you go back to earlier in the book of Acts, <clears throat> Acts chapter 5, the Lord busted Peter out of jail, all right? And they were all scratching their heads thinking, what, what the heck's going on here? And so there's lots of guards. I mean, I think, they got, I think they had guards to guard the guards. I think they had guards to keep an eye out in case there were any Christian sympathizers within the guards because of converts going on, you know, people just accepting the Lord all over the place. And, uh, you know, back then, if you were a really bad dude or someone they really were concerned about, they would put a guard on each side of you, all right, two guards. If you were just your average criminal, you know, you might get one guard. All right. But if you're a bad guy, you got two guards. Peter gets what? He gets four guards, man. Two on him and two watching the other two probably. I don't think they had chains on his legs and his hands and everything else. I just think, you know, there are two guys on each side of him and two more guys there. And they were in shifts kind of thing. And I mean, it was really quite the thing. So they're really quite concerned. They really want Peter to be arrested because he's seen as one of the ringleaders here. Well, verse 5 <coughs> says, Peter was therefore kept in prison but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. So remember what we just read in a few, verse, a few verses earlier. What happened to James? Put to death. So the church was praying. I mean, they were praying up a storm. The last thing they wanted was for Peter, another one of their leaders, to be put to death. A and, and you see this time and time again in the scriptures. And you say, well, I see it in my own life. You probably see it in your own life. Whenever there's a lot of heat, going on and you know what I mean by heat right whenever there's a lot of heat a lot of conflict a lot of fire and fury as you know president says down south I mean whenever there's a lot of crazy stuff going on you get down on your knees and you start praying up a storm right it's not until you are in a difficult situation that you really get serious on your hands and knees before the Lord now some of you probably remember my some of you have not heard this but some of you probably know my stories about going to a dentist right now I, I have a good dentist now, thank the Lord. All right, but I'm just saying, in past years, before moving to London, I've had experience, you know, when I go to a dentist, I have so much fear in my heart for dentists. I am praying, it is revival prayer meeting in the dentist chair. I am holding on to the dentist's arms chair. My, my, my fingers are white. Actually, days after I leave, you can see my fingerprints in the arms, all right? And, and, you know, they're scraping, they're scraping. And, and, and I, you know, I can do a lot of things. I can handle a lot of things. I can tolerate a lot of pain and whatever. But when they put that hook in your mouth and they start, and then they're going, okay, they're, and they're checking. And, and the way they can tell is when you go, you know, like they've hit something, right? I'm just saying. That's just my experience. And, and I, but I have an overactive imagination. And I just imagine that hook going right up into my brain for some reason. I'm not trying to make you afraid. I'm just telling you this is what happens to me, all right? And then th what that was like years ago where that, you know, I, I had some dental work I had to get done. But I'm praying up a storm. I am praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. One time a dentist stopped in the middle and looked at me and said, are you okay? I said, um, you know, I couldn't really say anything actually. Cause, but I, you know, and, and, and I realized my most intense time of prayer was sitting in that dentist chair. I, I had to go for like five times each week in a row. I was praying and praying and praying because I, I was just so afraid of, you know, just getting a little bit of pain. I would just say, freeze me as much as you can freeze me, all right, without, you know, totally making me into a cube of ice. But anyways, I would pray and pray and pray and pray, and there's something about earnest prayer. There's something about praying up a storm. There's something about when you, you're in those situations that you really don't want to be in. All of us have different things that we could, mine is the dentist story. You have different stories, don't you? It's different for every single person. You can think of a loved one. You can think of a health situation. You can think, you know, a son, or a daughter, or a grandchild, whatever it is. You can think of a situation where prayer, prayer, prayer. Uh, the other James, the Lord Jesus' half-brother, in his epistle, in his letter, 
James says in James 5.16, if you want to jot it down, he says, James 5.16, the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The fervent prayer of a righteous person is very powerful and effective. And then he talks about, in James 5, he, he uses the example of the prophet Elijah. And he says, Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. James 5.17. I like that wording there. It says, Elijah was a man just like us. He was a person just like you. Just like you. Every single one of you. Look at your, you know, point at yourself and think, well, Elijah was just like me. Exactly. We imagine these prophets of the Old Testament and these apostles with, you know, a great big S under their robes, like they're some sort of super superhuman. But it says clearly they were just like us. They weren't perfectly you know, without sin or anything like that. He, but Elijah was a man of faith, and he, he had fervent prayer. When he took on the prophets of Baal and all those false prophets, and he heard that Jezebel was out to kill him, do you remember what happened to him? He, he ran for the hills, and he, got, he, he was so discouraged. You know what happens when you're depressed and discouraged? What do you do? You usually go lay down and sleep for a bit, don't you? Isn't that what he did? He went and he slept for a while. And, and, but, you know, and so you, you see the humanness of these supermen and super people in the Bible. But it says he was a person just like us. But he prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. It didn't rain. And then he prayed that it would rain, and it rained. Fervent, powerful, effective prayer. Hebrews 11.6, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone that who believes in him must believe that he exists and rewards those who earnestly seek him. The church in this verse, verse 5, was earnestly seeking the Lord. They were praying like crazy that the Lord would rescue Peter. Well, let's dive back in. Look at verse 6. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Verse 7. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And its chains fell off his hands. So you've got to turn on your mental television sets here in your brain. Imagine this. Here was Peter. He's bound in chains, locked behind a prison door. All right? Guards galore all over the place. There was no natural way out. There's no hope of any kind of escape. And he's in bondage. Literally, he's bound. He's in bondage. There's no hope. The only hope is a supernatural intervention, a supernatural deliverance. And so an angel of the Lord appeared. Light shines in the prison. All right? The angel wakes Peter up, and it says, you know, it struck him. I think he probably might have given him a good kick or something like that. But anyway, and usually with Peter... You know, how many times does it take the Lord to get him going? Three. But this, I think the angels knew that. He just gave him a really good kick. All right. And then here's the thing about Peter. Whenever, there, whenever people should be praying, what is Peter usually doing? Like in the Garden of Gethsemane? He's sleeping. Here he is. The church is doing an all-night prayer meeting. And what's he doing? Yeah, he didn't suffer from insomnia. We knew that about Peter, all right? His gift was the gift of being able to sleep through some of the most difficult situations. Anyway, so uh, as we read on, take a look at verse 8. It says, so the angel strikes him. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. Verse 9. So he went out and followed him and did not know what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Verse 10, when they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them on its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. So here's this miraculous event happening. And Peter kind of really, he really didn't figure out what was going on while, while this was happening to him. A and that's often the case when we ask God for help. What are you talking about? 
Well, a lot of times we pray and we're asking the Lord for help, and you don't eat, sometimes figure it out until after it's all done. You know, and in the midst of difficult situations, you're in this daze, there's a lot of mess going on, and you, you know, you can just sort of see the, the things that are in front of you, and it's not until you look back and you start to see how the hand of God was doing this, speaking to that person, moving this into place. Well, verse 11, And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. If you look at verse 11, it says he had come to himself. He came to himself. He, he actually, he, it was so surreal. Uh, have you ever had that happen to you where it's so bad, it's so crazy, it's so intense? You know, I've had that happen a few times in my life where you heard something so strange, so weird, it's almost like the room started to, it was like the room spun in a, one of those TV shows or something like that. And, uh, You're beside yourself. You don't have control over the situation. And and you might feel like, you know, well, he felt like he was in a trance. Like, you know, the lights were on, but nobody was home. He was uh, looking at people, listening to people. And and sometimes, you know, the Lord has to give you a good kick. And that's what the angel did to Peter. All right, got him going. Got him, woke him up, smelled the coffee sort of thing. Now, do you remember when we studied back in the book of Revelation? Uh, For those of you that were here, when we studied through the book of Revelation in those first three chapters, There were seven letters to the messenger of each church, all right? And we saw the word, the word messenger, me, is the word angelos, all right? And there's, for every single of the seven churches, there was, you know, the messenger or the servant of that church. And the word angelos, we saw, has two meanings. It means like an angel, a heavenly angel, but it also means a messenger, as in, a heavenly messenger. Now, in here, it, we see the word in the original language is the word angelos, and you know from the context that it's obviously an angel, a heavenly messenger, all right? But every single one of us here this morning, do you know that every one of you, you're an angelos? Did you know that? You're, a mess, you're, you're not a heavenly messenger. You're an earthly messenger, if you will. But the, the angel here was a rescuer of Peter in prison. And I, wanted, I, I just want to throw this out to every single one of you this morning. Where, you know, the Lord has lots of people out there who need rescuing. There's a lot of people out there who are in bondages. There's a lot of people out there who are in chains of their own making and of their own decisions. Whether it's something that's chemical or something, you know, liquid in a bottle or whether it's something... Um, of their own thinking or a situation. Other people have put them in. There's people who are in prisons, and they're not steel bars. And the Lord wants to send a messenger to them and set them free. And the question is, are you willing to be a messenger from the Lord? Are you willing to be the person who carries a message from the Lord to them that sets them free? I think the Lord is looking for bondage breakers. You hear what I'm saying? And you don't have the power. Only the Lord can do it. All right? But if you take the Lord's message to people and they hear it and they act on it, God will do something. The light will shine if you just say the words and let the Lord use you. It's just that simple. Well, verse 12. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. All right, so the guards and Peter, they were sleeping, and here is the church. They were praying all through the night. They were at Mary's house. It was one of those all-night prayer meetings. Uh, You know, in our church here at Calvary Chapel London, we have not yet done an all-night prayer meeting. Uh, In my old church, we did numerous all-night prayer meetings. I mean, we would pray all night through the night, believe it or not, and we would see some pray. It, 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 it's not like something happened the next day, but like a week or two later, crazy things would start to happen that only the hand of God could orchestrate. And w- as soon as I started to see that, I realized an all-night prayer meeting is a really good idea, and nobody does it anymore. 
But we see it in the book of Acts. We see it in the history of the church down through the centuries. And I'm a big believer in it because that's when you see the hand of God really come through in a big way. Verse 13. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you're beside yourself or you're crazy. Uh, Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. All right, so stop right there. So here's this girl, Rhoda. She, you know, she hears Peter knocking or wants to come in. Rhoda goes down and sees, looks, sees it, it's Peter, comes running back, and she's telling everybody, and they all say she's nuts. And there's a couple things to note here. Number one, first of all, they had a belief back then in guardian angels, right? and they believed that um, at least certain people back then uh, in New Testament times believed that your guardian angel sort of looked like you. All right, So that's why when she looked at Peter, she thought, or, you know, she, when she came back and reported, they said, well, it's his angel. So do you understand what I'm, what's, what's being said here in the text? All right. Secondly, it's interesting. Um, here is the church praying for a miracle. And they finally get a miracle. What are they praying for? They're praying for Peter to get set free, right? That's what they're praying for. Well, look at verse 16. Take a look. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were astonished. I I mean, I like that. Why do do I like that? Well, they were so shocked that God answered their prayer. They said, I can't believe God answered prayer. Wow. Now why are we like that, guys? Why are we so surprised? It's like it it kind of expresses our unbelief, doesn't it? It kind of shows, you know, it's like, well, we're, we're better than doing nothing. Right. And and, and I I sometimes wonder why the Lord just doesn't give up on me sometimes because God is graceful. Thank thankfully um, he puts up with me. But look at verse 17. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. All right. The story turned out much different than for many other people in the early church. Peter got out of prison. But many people in that first century and second century were put to death, all right, including the other James. Now here it says, and you'll notice in verse 17, Peter gives thanks to the Lord. Um, he doesn't say, oh, thank you, guardian angel. He doesn't, do you notice that? He says, oh, you know, the Lord got me out. The Lord got me out. He doesn't, say, he doesn't even say the angel got me out. He says the Lord got me out. Uh, I'll just throw it out to you for what it's worth. You know, we don't pray to saints. We don't pray to angels. We give credit to the Lord all the time. All right? Not to men, not to angels. We give credit to the Lord. And Peter says, look what he says here in verse 17. He says, tell James. The, and, and this is the other James who was in charge of the Jerusalem church. Um, now, notice here what P- <coughs> Peter was saying. Peter's saying <coughs> what Peter's doing here. Peter was here at this house, but then he says he went to another place. He went to another place. And there's a lesson there. What, what do you mean there's a lesson in that? Well, God delivered Peter supernaturally, broke him out of prison, uh, and Peter could have stayed in Jerusalem at that place. That would have been one of the first places they would have went to look. But, you know, you have to use your common sense as well. And you got to use some wisdom. And you sort of get away from where all the heat was. P- when they went to kill Paul, what did he do? They lowered him over a wall in a basket. All right? It wasn't like he's being chicken or anything like that. It's just why do you, you don't run into the jaws of death. All right? It's kind of like, you know, we want to preach the gospel. So anyways, let's read on here. Verse 18. And it says, Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And when he went down from Judea to Caesarea, and there he stayed there. So that's quite the interesting detail there, guys. Um, I'm sure... Some of you probably read that. 
and you're thinking, okay, so Peter got busted out by an angel, and the guards get put to death. And some of you might be thinking, well, that's unfair, right? That's unfair. It's unfair for the soldiers. And, and I'm not here to debate the fairness, the unfairness, but let me just say this. This happened 2,000 years ago, which ought to put things in perspective. Regardless of who you are this morning, regardless of who those soldiers were, every single human being has an expiry date stamped on them. It's invisible. I'm not saying it's stamped on your rear end or something like that. I'm just saying it's invisible. There is an actual expiry date, an actual date where everything comes to an end. Every single human being. And you don't know what day that is. Only the Lord himself knows that date. You can't see it. No one can see it. Only God can see it. And when it's your time, it's your time. And whether it you know, seems unfair, the real question is this. Are you ready to meet God? Every single human being needs to come to that place in their life where they ask themselves, am I ready to meet the Lord today? If the lights were to go out right now, if something unexpected, out of my control, just like those guards, and it may seem totally unfair, am I ready to meet the Lord? This is one of these situations where people read the Bible and they go, they look at the Bible and they go, that's so unfair. How can I believe in a God like that? Listen, this is one of those things where you read the Bible and you ask yourself, is this prescriptive or is it descriptive? Prescriptive is where it says, you know, God made this happen. Well, God didn't make this happen. This was one human being doing it to another human being. Herod gave the order to have these guards put to death, which means it's not prescriptive from God. It is. It's just describing what's going on. And this is what human beings have been doing to human beings all along. All right? That's just the way it is. And it shows you the seriousness of what's going on here. All right? Every single one of us has an expiry date. Um, when I was over in Kenya, I was talking to the older uh, teenagers, about 15 guys and about four girls. And uh, um, I was trying to just challenge them, stir up their hearts a little bit. I said, you know, you're young right now. You're 16, 17, 18 years old. But, you know, the Bible says something very interesting. And I had them, oh, stay here in Acts 12. Turn with me to Psalm 90. I'm going to do something a little different this morning. How many of you like math? How many of you hate math? <laughs> Good. All right. Well, that's, a good th that's why you have a calculator on your phone. All right. So in Psalm 90, it talks about the importance of understanding the shortness of your life because anything could come at you. And in Psalm 90, verse 10, it says the days of our lives are 70 years. And, and if we have the strength, uh, by reason of strength, we could live to 80 years. All right. And yet, their boast is only labor and sorrow, and it is soon cut off and we fly away. And who knows the power of your, you know, and it, it talks about there in verse 10, all right? It's, it says, you know, in verse 12, actually, it says, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Did you, did you, did you read those two verses, verse 10 and verse 12? It says you have 70 years, and if you have strength, you have maybe 80 years. Now, some of you may live to 90 I mean, it, I've talked to people who are 90 and 100, and they say, well, you know, they told me it was the golden years. It doesn't feel so golden, you know, <laughs> all right? And that's what I've heard time and time again. All right? And some people are blessed. They have no aches and pains when they hit eight, 90 and whatever that. But here it says, you know, you can count on probably 70 years, 70 good years, maybe 80 good productive years. So let me ask you this. Do you know how many days are in 80 years? Well, how many days are in one year? 365. Well, why don't you take out a pen and paper right now? And on the back of your bulletin, I know you're not taking notes. So let's do something here. Do you know what 80 times 365 is? Go ahead. Do the math right now. 80 times 365. Huh? All right. Somebody use a calculator. All right. So they're cheating. All right. 29,200. <laughs> I think I already asked him that question. I'm just kidding. 20, that's right. You have 29,200 days. Well, no, hold it. You don't have 29,200 days. Because if you take your age, I happen to be 50. I don't look good. I, I don't know. But anyways, but do, do the math. Well, actually, I'm 51, right? 51 times, do the math, 
take your, not my number, take your own number. Go 51 or 39 times 365. Do this. Times 365. Well, it says I've lived 18,650 days, plus some change, because I, you know, I'm a little older than actual. Are you doing this? Are you doing this? Really? Okay, do it right now. Take your age times 365. Well, we're going to just, you know, give you grace. <laughs> and then you subtract 29,200 from the, so I'm going to do it right now. 29,200, subtract that. I have 10,800 no, 500 days left. That's how many days I got left. I got 10,000 days left. That's pretty crazy. Now, I did it, I did it, when I did it in Kenya, I did it, and there was somebody in the room that was 82. It, it wasn't, it didn't go so well for him. <laughs> he was kind of depressed after my message. But anyways, I'm just saying, how many days you got left? Who did the math? Come on, let's hear it. How many days you got left? You got 5,900 days, all right? How many days you got left? Some of you are saying, I don't know how to do math. I can't do this. That's a lot of days. <laughs> all right, who else did the math? 11,680, 11, okay? And some of you didn't do it because you need to go home and do it. You need to figure this out, all right? Because what does the Bible say in verse 12? Teach us to number our days that we might get a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we might get a heart of wisdom. I have, well, I got that many days left. What am I going to use with those, those many days? I have an expiry date. The Lord's kind of putting it in my mind. Yeah, you could live 70 years, Ed. You might live 60, but you could live 70 years. You might live 80 years. So with that in mind, get some wisdom in your heart. Make your life count for something. Start living for what really matters. Because you don't know whether you're going to be like these soldiers who all of a sudden something really unfair happens to them. And it's beyond your control, but there it is. And we stand before the Lord. Now let's go back to Acts chapter 12. Wasn't that fun? Well, it was fun for me because I got lots of days left. All right, so let's go back to Acts chapter 12. And it says, but when Herod had searched for him, talking about Peter, and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Verse 20, now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus the uh, king's personal aid their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country so these two cities Tyre and Sidon if you're looking on a ma map modern day uh, nowadays they're where modern day Lebanon is to the north of Israel anyways these people were in a dispute with King Herod and so Herod probably squeezed them by cutting off their food supply and so they're very anxious to come and meet with him and do some deal making Anyways, they got the message loud, loud and clear. That's what's going on here. Verse 21. This is, but there's something going on here about Herod. This is important. So on a set day, Herod, arraigned in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration, a speech to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not a man. The voice of a God and not a man. Talk about flattery. Talk about praise. Well, Herod loved this. He, and he, and that's his, he was a man pleaser, and he was a popularity seeker. Uh, the Jewish historian writing for the Romans, Josephus, um, he described this event, and he wrote this. He said, Herod's clothing was made wholly of silver and of a texture truly wonderful. And when the morning sun shone on his clothes, it shone so brightly that the people hailed him as a god. And Herod... Didn't deny it, didn't reject it, didn't stop it, stop it. He just soaked in it. He, be, he just said, keep it coming. I love it. Just keep it coming. Yeah, the voice of a God from my mouth. Verse 23, look at this. Then immediately <clears throat> an angel of the Lord struck him. Talk about being struck. First Peter, now him. The angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God 
and he was eaten by worms and died. Horrible end. And he would never have guessed this was going to happen to him. He just gave the order and had a bunch of guards killed, and he wanted to get Peter killed. James, at the beginning of the chapter, had been put to death. We see a lot of people with expiry dates. This guy had an expiry date. As powerful and as prestigious and amazing as he thought himself to be. Soren Kierkegaard, Christian theologian and philosopher, said this, The tyrant dies and his rule ends. The martyr dies and his rule begins. Isn't that good? This is a perfect contrast of what's going on here in this chapter. Hindsight, 2,000 years later, we're looking at it. It's all 2020. Who would you rather be? James with God in verse 2? Or Herod proclaimed as a God in verse 22? Both are dead now. Ask yourself, all right, who has the power in his hand to give life to either of those people? Well, it's the Lord. And it's all a matter of perspective. We looked at Psalm 90. You know, there is a certain conviction that the apostles had. And it, th- those convictions about the shortness of life, the brevity of life, and this perspective that this is temporal and that's eternal, it's so incredibly important. And that's why we get into the Word of God, and that's why the Word of God shapes our thinking We start to see with God's eyes. We start to see with God's perspective because he puts his convictions in in our hearts when we get into the word. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is so important. These early apostles had a certain conviction in their hearts about what this life was about and what they were living for and living for what really matters. And they they had a certain conviction and they had a certain perspective of how they saw everything. Want to put me to death? Go right ahead. I know what I'm living for. I know who has the power to give me life. Um, now, before I move on to the next few verses, talking about Herod, you know, he's, he's given a speech, and people are saying, you know, the voice of a God, the voice of a God, and he, he's just soaking up, and he's a man pleaser, he's a seeker, seeker of popularity, and, and I like the wording here <coughs> that we just read. Um, um, it says here, well, it, it says that he failed to give praise to God, and an angel struck him. Now, an angel struck Peter, to get up, get him moving. But here, an angel struck Herod. And he failed, and it's interesting wording, he failed to praise God. Here he is receiving the praises of man, and the Lord strikes him down. What's going on here? Well, here's what's going on. He took something that only belonged to God, which is praise and worship. And God judged him. <clears throat> I'm reminded in Luke 18 of the Pharisee who's in the, t- you know, worshiping the Lord and the tax collector sitting at the back and the Pharisee's going, oh, Lord, I, I fast twice a week. I tithe. I pray. I'm faithful. I'm a pretty good guy. And I hope you're noticing it. And the poor tax collector's at the back and he's so ashamed he can't even lift up his eyes to God. He says, woe is me. And then Jesus says, well, who walked away justified? The tax collector. You know, here is this Pharisee who was there to praise God and worship God and focus on God, and he's not praising God and worshiping God. He's praising himself, and he's worshiping himself, and that's what pride does. Pride will take the highest of angels, Lucifer, and turn him into a hideous demon, and that's what pride does within our hearts. Pride does some ugly things within our hearts. Pride did something horrible within Herod's heart, and God says no more, and he strikes him down. And that's it. The moment you and I, you know, no, never let pride get in your heart. Never let pride get in your head. The moment, the, the second a prideful thought comes into your mind, I say humble yourself before God, give him praise, or you could end up being like a Nebuchadnezzar. Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar? standing on the roof of his palace in the book of Daniel, saying, look at what I have done. Just amazing. And he's praising himself, and he's full of pride, and the Lord struck him down, and it's like a, it's like a mental illness, and he starts eating grass. I mean, he's, like, he's got mental, uh, men- and there is an actual mental di- disorder where pe- you know, people act like that, and they act like an animal. 
that's and he, his hair, you know, nails grew and his hair and he was he looked like an animal. And it wasn't until he stopped and acknowledged God and gave praise to God and humbled himself that God healed him. Don't let pride enter your heart. Last two verses. We're, we're going to be done here. Look at this. So it talks about how Herod was struck down and he died and worms were on the inside and his intestines, I believe, they, they, they write. Verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and they also took with them John whose surname was Mark. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 40 has an interesting parallel here. Isaiah chapter 40, if you want to jot it down, says this, all men are like grass. We've been talking about grass this morning. You know, the kind that's on your lawn. Um, all men are like grass. All women are like grass. And their glory is like the flowers of the field. Here, here's Herod. He's in this incredible vestment. He's shining and people are shouting praises to him. But Isaiah 40 says, all men, all women are like grass. Their glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. That's Isaiah 40, verses 6 to 8. Here is Herod in his glory, shining splendor, right? And then he's struck down. He's like grass. But every single human being, every single one of us, we're like a blade of grass in the desert. It shoots up, but it's desert. And this is the Middle East we're talking about. It doesn't last long, and it's gone in a day. Verse 24 talked about the word of God spreading. These apostles were so committed to the word of God and the spreading of the message of God because they, were the, they saw themselves as the messengers of God, as the only ones who could bring it to the world. And do you remember what I said a few weeks ago? There are three things that are eternal. Everything else is temporal. If you want to jot something down, this is it. There's three things eternal. God, God's word, and the souls of men. And the extent that you are committed to those three things are the extent that you are committed for living for eternity. James, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Peter, Bartholomew, Andrew, Thomas, Barnabas, Paul, you know, they all, they're all dead. Herod, he's dead. They've been dead for 2,000 years ago. Someone once said that, you know, on gravestones, and I, I've looked at gravestones and I, when, after I heard this, and I, I said, yeah, look, at, isn't that interesting? On gravestones, there's two dates, right? The, day you're, the date you're born, and the date you die, and there's a little line in the middle, and that line represents your life. Your 70 or your 80 years, if you have the strength. The little line, that's it. That's what your life is, a little line. And one day after that, we stand before God, and he asks us, what, do you, what did you do with the gifts I gave you? Well, what gifts? I gave you the gift of Jesus, number one. What did you do with Jesus? Because that determines how long the line goes if it gets extended. You hear what I'm saying? Because if you accept Jesus, he gives you eternal life, and that little line becomes an infinite line, an eternal line. And the second gift is, or the second th- gift that God gives us is, what did you do with the life I gave you? And he's talking to Christians, I think. What did you do with the life I gave you? Did you live for what really matters? Did you live for the eternal? Did you, or just for the here and now? Was it all about you, or was it all about the Lord? Let's pray. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord this morning. Father, we thank you for the challenge of your word. We thank you for these contrasts of people in this chapter. People who are your witnesses, people who died for you, people who lived and died for you. And we see someone else living for his own glory and for the praise of man. We see guards who were struck down. And it looks unfair. And like all of us, you call us to number our days. Teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. And so I pray this morning, Lord, that you would do that, that you would teach us to number our days, that, Lord, there would be a wisdom, that would a conviction in our hearts that would shape our perspective so that when we see death, when we see harassment, when we see persecution, as these early Christians did, we would understand There is a greater hope. There's a greater glory. There's a greater reality, an eternal reality. Lord, that we would walk by faith and not by sight. That we would have earnest prayer within our hearts. That we would be men and women of faith who are willing to take a risk. 
Lord, I don't want to be a caretaker or an undertaker. I want to be a risk taker for you, a person who lives by faith, but a person who has wisdom like Peter. And so, Lord, I pray this morning for every single person here, give us grace to let these words be put into our hearts, to put down roots, to bear fruit, to shape our perspective, to see that we're living for the eternal God, for the eternal word of God, and for the eternal souls of men and women. And so, Father, we commit ourselves to you. May we be messengers. May we be bondage breakers. May we be people who shine light because we're sharing Jesus in people's prison cells. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray, raise us up. Prepare us to be your servants, to be your messengers. Thank you, Father. We bless you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor this morning. Thank you, Lord, for just the work of your Holy Spirit through your word right now. And now as we go our separate ways, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in Jesus' name.